Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Rolling Up Our Sleeves, How to Plan and Implement Quality Improvement Activities Focused on Family Engagement. My name is Kate Taft. I am the Associate Director for Child and Adolescent Health at the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, or AMCHIP. And this webinar was originally planned as a three-hour skills building session to be presented at the 2018 AMCHIP Annual Conference. Um, however, due to some circumstances beyond our control, the faculty for this session were unable to present at the regularly scheduled workshop and had to cancel the session. Um, today, uh, we will be presenting you a condensed version of that skills building workshop that was originally intended for the AMCHIP conference. Uh, while we won't be able to facilitate the originally um, planned team activities, the resources developed for these activities uh, will be available for download following the webinar. The, the faculty for today include Alex Kuznetsov and Muge Chavdar. Um, Alex Kuznetsov is the Manager of Children with Special Needs Initiatives at the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, Ms. Kuznetsov previously served as the Program Manager for the National Center for Medical Home Implementation, Family Engagement, Quality Improvement Project, and has worked for the National Center since 2013. Uh, Muge Chapdar is the Program Manager of the National Center for Medical Home Implementation. Uh, she is a former Maternal and Child Health, or MCH, trainee, and holds a Master's of Public Health and Community Health Sciences with a concentration in MCH from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, before our faculty begin, I'd like to inform you of some housekeeping items. The slides will appear in the central window of your screen and will advance automatically. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the question box window on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, these questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If we do not have time to answer your questions during the webinar, uh, we will send you an answer directly uh, via email afterwards. And finally, this webinar will be recorded and archived on the National Center for Medical Home Implementation website uh, approximately one week after this presentation. Also, after the webinar, you'll receive an email with a link to the webinar evaluation. And we encourage you to complete this evaluation so we can continue to improve the content and manner of our presentations in the future. And I just would like to say that today's presenters have no financial or conflict of interest disclosures to announce. So this slide presents the three learning objectives for today's webinar, uh, which were also the objectives for the uh, skills building session for the conference. By the end of today's webinar, we hope participants will be able to discuss the role of maternal and child health programs in planning, implementing, and evaluating quality improvement projects focused on family engagement. Um, we hope that you'll be able to describe a strategy uh, maternal and child health programs and stakeholders can use to enhance family engagement, and identify tools and resources that maternal and child health programs and stakeholders can utilize to support quality improvement efforts focused on family engagement. And um, note that by maternal and child health programs, we mean it broadly to include state maternal and child health Title V programs, the Title V Children Use with Special Health Care Needs programs, pediatric clinicians, family organizations, and other organizations um, or audience members that have a stake and interest in family engagement. So this slide is the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, we'll begin with a short introduction and overview of the Family Engagement Quality Improvement Project and the National Center for Medical Home Implementation, uh, or National Center, which is the organization that facilitated this project. Then the faculty will provide a quick overview of the online implementation guide. And uh, please note that all of you who registered for the webinar received a link to this implementation guide in advance of the webinar. Uh, our faculty will share a how-to implementation strategies for any organization interested in replicating the work. And then uh, webinar participants will have about 15 minutes at the end to ask questions. So um, as previously mentioned, this webinar is based on content that was originally intended to be presented at an in-person skills building session at the AMCHIP conference. Uh, all individuals who registered for the session received a link to complete a short survey to elicit information on participant profession, the state in which uh, they conduct their maternal and child health work, 
and a definition of what family engagement means to the participants. Uh, we had 76 individuals registered for the session and received 32 responses to the survey. So we would like to share a few participant responses with you today. Um, based on the survey results, most respondents identified themselves as a family member or advocate. The next largest profession represented was Title V uh, Children Use of Special Health Care Needs Program staff. And then there was a fairly equal split between the number of respondents who identified as um, health care provider, professional, community-based, or local organization staff, um, other, and educational provider or professional. Uh, this table represents the regions where respondents conduct most of their maternal and child health um, and children use special health care needs work. Of those who answered the survey, each of the 10 HRSA regions, as well as uh, the U.S. territories, were represented. Um, so we're glad to share results from a geographically and professionally diverse group. And uh, one of the other survey questions asked respondents to define family engagement. Uh, this slide just highlights two of the definitions that were provided. Um, while many of the answers shared some common components, we did receive 32 different and unique answers. Um, so of the two examples on the screen, one is uh, that family engagement is an intentional partnership to understand and value family beliefs and encourage involvement to improve services to meet the needs of the family. Another definition was um, family engagement is working with the families from the start whether it's developing a new program or enhancing existing ones, this helps to ensure that whatever is being designed or created will be more successful at meeting their needs. Uh, we also asked respondents to rank where they believe that their organization falls on the family engagement or partnership continuum. Uh, 17 respondents said that they ranked at the partnership level, which is families and caregivers in my organization work from an agreement base of shared values. Uh, four respondents ranked at um, the level of collaboration, which involves trust based on negotiated and agreed actions. Um, seven respondents ranked their organization at cooperation, which means no fixed or long-term relationship is implied. There is no ongoing or formal commitment. And four respondents um, each ranks their organization at networking, which includes informal discussions held with families and caregivers and my organization. Um, and then no one ranked their, um, themselves at the coexistence level. So we were pleased to note that um, so many respondents rate themselves at the partnership level of the continuum. And we recognize that this audience may be uh, further along and advanced in terms of family engagement. But it's important to note that a lot of other organizations, uh, including pediatric practices, may not be this far along. Uh, there is still a lot of work to be done, and it's great to see that so many of you are in organizations that can share knowledge and expertise. And then this slide just shows the definition of family engagement that was utilized throughout the Family Engagement Quality Improvement Project. Uh, we will be presenting information on that project in just a moment. Um, people in organizations are starting with a different baseline understanding and experience of family engagement. Therefore. Um, Projects focused on family engagement need to take this into consideration when planning, implementing, and evaluating their work. So with that, I'd like to now turn it over to Alex Kuznetsov to give an overview of the Family Engagement Quality Improvement Project. Alex? Yep. Thank you so much, Kate. And hello and welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. As Kate mentioned, my name is Alex Kuznetsov, and I serve as the project manager for the Family Engagement Quality Improvement Project. So over the next few minutes, I will be providing a very quick overview of the project and then discussing some key lessons learned. Before I jump into the project, I just want to begin by recognizing that family engagement can be implemented at multiple levels. So one-on-one -on -one with clinicians and families, within healthcare organizations, and then at the systems level. So while the National Center's project focused on practice-based quality improvement and family engagement, during today's webinar, we will also be focusing on family engagement at the systems level. As many of you know, one of the national outcome measures for the Title V block grant is the percent of children with special health care needs who receive care within a well-functioning system. This national outcome measure is a composite measure that includes whether or not the family feels like they're a partner in their child's care. 
Additionally, multiple Title V national performance measures can be improved through enhanced family engagement. Uh, for example, performance measures related to medical homes, transitions, and developmental screening and surveillance. And finally, I did want to mention the National Survey of Children's Health. While this is an instrument designed to assess levels of family engagement, it's also important to recognize that this survey is based on parent response, further indicating the importance of engaging families in our work and in systems of care. Now that we've talked a little bit about the importance and relevance of family engagement to systems of care, I wanted to share some information about the National Center for Medical Home Implementation, which is the organization that facilitated this project. The National Center is a cooperative agreement between the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau in the Health Resources and Services Administration. With close to 20 years of experience, the National Center works in cooperation with federal agencies and other partners and stakeholders to ensure that all children and youth have access to a medical home. One of the National Center's primary focus areas is provision of technical assistance and support the Title V programs to assist in achieving National Performance Measure 11, which is medical home. However, the National Center also works with and provides technical assistance to a lot of other organizations, including family to family health information centers, pediatric clinicians and practices, AAP chapters, and community based organizations. So the project I'll be providing you an overview with today is actually the third iteration of a quality improvement project focused on family-centered care within the National Center. And I won't be discussing the previous iterations during today's webinar, mostly because of time constraints, but if you have any questions about the history of our work, there will be contact information provided at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to reach out and email us um, with questions, and we'll be happy to provide you with that background. This particular project utilized the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Learning Collaborative and Web and Action Models to educate teams on quality improvement methodology and family engagement. Several teams incorporated small tests of change using plan, do, study, act cycles. Multidisciplinary core improvement teams were recruited, and these teams consisted of a lead pediatrician, a non-pediatrician clinician, administrative staff, and a parent partner. The project began with baseline data collection and an in-person learning session. After the learning session, teams began a six-month action period and upon completing the action period, teams met for a second and final in-person learning session. So the AIM statement for this project is included on this slide. An in quality improvement and AIM statement is a measurable, time-specific description of desired outcomes. So it essentially answers the question, what are we trying to accomplish throughout this project? Um, and uh, we have a detailed PDF outlining the project AIM and the project measures on the Quality Impro Improvement Implementation Guide that's available on our National Center's website that we'll be discussing a little bit later on in today's presentation. This project included the following interventions, which were designed to support measurable improvements in family engagement. So I already mentioned the two in-person learning sessions, which were held at the beginning and end of the action period. We developed a comprehensive change package uh, which feature tools and resources on each of the project measures, and it also included sample plan, do, study, act cycles that demonstrated how to actually use the tools to test changes in practice. We held monthly educational webinars, which featured guest faculty for a lecture presentation, followed by 30 minutes of interactive discussion with the team. We held coaching calls between individual teams and a quality improvement advisor. We also offered an optional peer support network um, initiative, which was offered to teams that had similar characteristics. So this offered another opportunity for peer learning and connection between the teams. The project expert work group included a family member, and this individual hosted two calls with parent partners to offer technical assistance and support. And finally, we sent out monthly email messages with tools and resources to all project participants. So this slide um, provides an overview of the project measures. This project contained 12 measures, which were designed to demonstrate improvement on the project aim. Six of the measures were collected through review of medical records, and six of the measures were collected through the use of post-visit family surveys. So these surveys were modeled after the CGCAP survey. They were translated into English and Spanish, 
And we also worked with a health communications company to ensure that the surveys were written at a sixth grade reading level. I will mention, though, that these surveys were not validated or psychometrically tested. Data collection for the project included the following instruments. Uh, a pre- and post-implementation survey was distributed to practice teams at the beginning and at the end of the project. I already mentioned the post-visit family surveys and medical record reviews, which were designed to collect data on each of the project's 12 measures. Each month, teams submitted monthly progress reports. Project staff and the Quality Improvement Advisor utilized feedback from these reports to determine topics for monthly educational webinars and also to identify um, any additional assistance or support that practices may need. And then at the end of the project, practices were given the option to participate in qualitative interviews at the very end um, just to share some of their experiences and provide some more feedback. A key and unique component of this project were parent or caregiver partners. So each core improvement team was required to have a parent partner as part of that core improvement team. A job description was developed uh, for this position to clearly outline roles and responsibilities. And there were a number of initiatives that we implemented to support these individuals. Parent partners were encouraged to participate in monthly educational calls, quality improvement coaching calls, and we offered specific calls between parent partners and a family member that was a member of our expert work group. During the second and final in-person learning session of the project, we hosted a parent-caregiver panel discussion which was facilitated by a family leader. And this discussion served as a platform for project participants to hear firsthand the experiences of parent partners participating in this initiative. And our evaluations from that learning session actually showed that this was the most popular session during the, the entire learning session. So these are just a few high-level results and lessons learned from the project. We're pleased to say that data from the pre- and post-implementation surveys demonstrated a 77.8% increase in family engagement knowledge. Medical record review measures um, had a couple improvements, particularly those related to family strength, creation of care plans, and communication of age-appropriate screening results with patients and families. Unfortunately, the project measures that were based on post-visit family surveys did not yield valid results. So I mentioned earlier that this survey was not a validated instrument, and the development of a validated instrument was not the purpose of the project. Uh, we did see that most families that completed the survey answered yes for pretty much all of the questions, and even when teams converted the survey responses from yes-no options to a Likert scale, we received similar results. And after speaking to a lot of families, uh, we learned that um, surveys are probably not the best way to obtain feedback, especially from families who are coming into a practice and they have a child with very complex needs. Um, it's pretty much the last thing that a family wants to do when they um, are coming into the practice is complete a survey. So we really had to think about uh, what other strategies we can use to engage families and to um, obtain feedback from families. Some other lessons learned um, included a really strong focus on how and the practical components of implementing family engagement. Um, practices really wanted strategies and tools and resources they could implement day to day. While having a parent partner is a critical part of the project, we learned that it was very important um, to provide clear roles and responsibilities both on part of the practice and the parent partner. And building this relationship takes time, effort, and education on everyone's behalf. And finally, encouraging small tests of change is very important and celebrating successes. Throughout the project, we encountered a few challenges which presented opportunities for improvement for anybody wishing to replicate our work. Understanding quality improvement methodology remained a challenge for many teams, even at the end of the project. Many teams tried to test large changes or many changes all at once, and this was really overwhelming and just couldn't, um, didn't really uh, fit into the capacity of the teams. Um, so we provided a lot of quality improvement education through coaching calls and through monthly educational webinars, and also during the in-person learning sessions. So this is where Title V programs or um, you know, any other organization that's implementing similar work, whether it's a family to family health information center or an AAP chapter or an, um, you know, an academic medical center 
can really help by providing tools and resources to clinicians and all their team members around quality improvement methodology. Particularly for pediatricians that are based in larger institutions, such as FQHCs or academic medical centers, it was challenging to encourage scale-up and spread. Um, so one opportunity that we, that we recommend for the future is engaging senior leadership and getting their buy-in to the project at the very, very beginning. And this can really help with scale-up and spread. And again, this is an opportunity for Title V programs. Um, Title V programs that prioritize medical home and family engagement can provide tools and support um, whatever organizations are uh, working on, this, on these initiatives. I already discussed survey burnout a little bit, thinking outside the box in terms of um, collecting feedback from families. So thinking about focus groups, maybe social media um, or parent advisory groups instead of um, surveys to collect feedback from families. As I mentioned earlier, parent partners were a key component of the project, but it was very important to provide support and technical assistance to ensure that these individuals were equal members of the team when we're at the table. And I had mentioned in a previous slide many of the things that, are, um, that the National Center offers to support these individuals. A few of the project measures focused on care planning and family strength. Um, and we saw a lot of improvement in these measures, but at the very beginning of the project, teams really struggled to understand what care planning is in partnership with families and how to identify family strengths and how to use those. Um, to build relationships with families. So we provided a lot of education on these topic areas through monthly um, educational webinars, through one-on-one -on -one coaching calls, and during the learning session. Um, as I mentioned, six of the project measures uh, were collected through medical record reviews, and documentation of these measures in medical record reviews was challenging, especially because uh, practices had different EHR systems. So we actually created a medical record review tip sheet, which provided suggestions for acceptable documentation in multiple different EHRs um, in their medical records. And then finally, I think this can apply to pretty much everyone. Um, there is, you know, everyone's working at capacity. There is a lack of time to dedicate to quality improvement efforts. So really, again, thinking outside the box of how to bring people together without actually bringing them together in person. Um, using technology such as Skype or Zoom or social media or just phone calls um, to ensure that everyone that needs to be at the table is at the table. And then finally, and we'll, um, we'll send a link out to this after the webinar is over, our National Center developed a comprehensive tip sheet that focuses on practical strategies for implementation of similar projects. And this tip sheet is available through the National Center's website that Muge will talk about shortly. Um, I did want to mention that, again, um, that while this project is practice-based, there are key takeaways for Title V programs, family organizations, or anyone that's working at the systems level. Family engagement is a Title V block grant requirement, and this can be leveraged to implement initiatives similar to the one we discussed today. And finally, as Kate mentioned in the very beginning of this presentation, understanding that family engagement is a continuum and not all practices and professionals have the same definition of family engagement and are thinking about family engagement in the same way. So interventions and activities need to be tailored to this. Um, and it's really important to keep this in mind when planning similar work. So I will now turn it over to my colleague, Muge, to talk a little bit about our Family Engagement Quality Improvement Project Implementation Guide. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Um, as Alex mentioned, my name is Mika Shavdar, and I'm the Program Manager for the National Center for Medical Home Implementation. Um, as a result of this project, a web-based implementation guide was developed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the web-based implementation guide and then um, discuss and share some implementation strategies. Um, so the implementation guide is currently live on our National Center website. Um, it provides tools and resources needed for implementing family engagement QI projects um, in clinical practice or through multi-site learning collaboratives. Um, supporting documentation is also available on the implementation guide for individuals, organizations, or practices interested in applying for maintenance of certification part four or MOC part four um, or institutional review board applications um, for a family engagement project. And I want to mention, too, that all of our resources available on the National 
um, Center website and available on the implementation guide are um, free and they are customizable. So when you were registering for this webinar, all participants should have seen a link um, to a video tutorial for the implementation guide. And this tutorial provides an overview of each section of the guide and also provides brief details about various tools and resources included within. Um, so if any participants have questions about the implementation guide and resources provided, um, we'll be happy to provide technical assistance on this. And as Alice had mentioned, all of our contact information um, will be provided at the end of the PowerPoint. Okay, so the next few slides are going to um, talk about implementation strategies for teams, individuals, and organizations that are interested in replicating this project. So we're going to be talking about three main components, um, which are identifying needs, partners and resources, project planning, and supporting measurable improvement. Any type of organization that's interested in maternal and child health or family engagement um, can implement this project. And we really want to stress that point. Um, that this project can be implemented by MCH Title V programs, SHIN programs, Family to Family Health Information Centers, AAP chapters, practices, health systems, universities, and community organizations. Um, this project is tailorable to everyone. Um, so during the originally planned skill bu skills building session, our team had designed a few interactive activities around these strategies. Um, however, due to time limitations and the fact that this is a webinar, um, all of the resources and the handouts were actually sent in a pre-webinar email. Um, and so all of the, all of the handouts um, should have been delivered to your inbox. They'll also be archived on the National Center website, and they will also be distributed um, in a follow-up email. So now I want to talk about identifying needs, partners, and resources. The first step in implementing a family engagement QI project is going to be to conduct a needs assessment. Um, you need to identify the data, the demographics, partners, initiatives, and resources that you or your organization are going to need to move forward with this project. Um, an important step to this is to begin by identifying your target audience and collecting data on their demographic, demographics needs and strengths. Um, and luckily, many data sources have already collected and compiled this data um, and have made it available for public use. Um, identifying needs, strengths, and gaps of your target audience will also help set the stage for the quality improvement work that your team plans to implement and will support activities later in the planning process like um, setting up your project measure and project aims. Um, so this is a very critical step. A couple of examples of popular data resources um, that are currently available publicly and free are the Title V um, information systems and the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, both of these data sources will be discussed on the next slide, so I'm not going to go into too much detail right now. Um, another consideration, if you're planning on collecting your own data, um, is to consider how or what methodology you plan to use to do this. Um, how much data you're going to need, so what is your sample size going to be, and how do you plan to store, organize, and manage this data. Oh. Okay. So aligning activities and engaging partners in your expert work group who are already involved in family engagement efforts can also strengthen your quality improvement project. Um, the expert work group for our, for our FEQIP that Alex had mentioned um, provided oversight, training, and technical support to practice teams before, during, and after the project action period. Um, the expert work group should be multidisciplinary and include representation from both stakeholders and target audience members. Um, so a couple of examples of this can be community and state partners. Um, and community and state partners may already have established connections within your target population. They'll provide valuable insights and have access to resources. Um, this can also reduce duplication of efforts and support appropriateness of quality improvement activities. Um, another thing is that there may already be ongoing medical home or family engagement activities taking place in your state or in your community. And some of these may be implemented through your Medicaid and Title V programs or even through private insurers. So it's important to consider those partners as well. Um, families and caregivers should be engaged throughout the project, especially in the beginning phases, um, to, ensure that, um, to ensure that those most impacted by the project 
are equal partners in its design, implementation, and evaluation. A strategy to do this is to develop a parent caregiver partner job description, um, and this can help organizations recruit and support family caregiver engagement throughout the project. Um, you can also consider providing incentives like gift cards or child care services um, and professional development opportunities. Finally, you're going to need to identify resources such as um, human talent, technological, financial, state, and national um, that are available to your organization to assist with planning, implementation, or evaluation of this project. There might also be grant funding available, and you might be able to recruit volunteers or interns um, or obtain state professional development resources to support this work. Um, so one of our first handouts that, again, was sent in that pre-webinar email is focused on um, getting together all of these needs, partners, and resources. And this can really help um, to set the stage for your team for this work. So these are just a few of the resources that are from the National Center and some of our partners that can be useful to organizations interested in this project. Um, all of the resources are hyperlinked in this presentation, and they'll be available to you at the end of the webinar. Um, one of the first things you're going to want to do, again, is familiarize yourself with the needs in your state. Um, and the Child Data Resource Center, which is part of the Child um, and Adolescent Health Measurement Initiative, offers data from the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, and progress on national performance measures. This is an amazing resource, um, and it allows you to sort the data based on national performance measures, based on patient population, based on subgroup. It, it's, a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful resource. The Title V Information System provides you with your state Title V needs assessment and annual report, so you can see how the population is doing at large um, in this state. I also wanted to highlight some additional resources from the National Center. Um, that can help you identify partners and initiatives in your state. Um, our promising practices are a list of expert reviewed and evidence informed medical home practices across the country. Um, a few practices on this page, including the Holly Project and the New Jersey Medical Home Initiative, are currently working on family engagement activities. So this could be a great place to look um, if you're looking for new and innovative ideas on how to engage families in your practice. Um, the National Center also has a comprehensive list of medical home activities in all 50 states. And you can do this or you can um, figure out what's going on in your state by visiting our state pages. The National Center also partners with the National Academy for State Health Policy, or NASHB, to develop profiles of state Medicaid and children's health insurance programs that have focus on medical home implementation and family engagement. So these are just a great way to see what's going on at the state level. Um, and finally, a few other organizations such as the Family to Family Health Information Centers and state AAP chapters can be great partners to look to um, or to work with as you begin to plan this project. Next, we're going to be talking about project planning. Um, so now that your organization has identified an expert work group, has identified needs, partners, and resources, the next thing you're going to do is begin the project planning. Um, and a key step in the project planning phase is to convene the expert work group. Um, and this can be done either virtually or in person. And it's important um, within this expert work group to ensure that everybody's voice is heard and that every member of the expert work group feels empowered to share their expertise and provide guidance on how the project will be implemented and evaluated. Again, a handout was developed by the National Center to assist um, with this phase of the work. And it helps the organization um, to assign roles and responsibilities to work group members. So some resources on project planning. Um, all of the resources are a combination from the National Center and other national partners. Um, and as we've been discussing throughout this entire presentation, family engagement projects require um, many diverse stakeholders and individuals. And the resources presented in this section um, can support tips and strategies for establishing a multidisciplinary team. So the Form a Medical Home Improvement Team um, resource is a National Center resource that's available for practices who want to form a core improvement QI team. Uh, the resources and tools provided outline steps and strategies to assemble this group. The Primary Care Team Guide is not from the National Center, but it also provides tools and resources that teams can use to enhance team-based care and team cohesiveness. Um, this guide provides resources related to building a team, 
conducting team-based care, and paying for services. Um, the Forming a Team is a resource from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, and it's specific to outlining roles and responsibilities of quality improvement teams, and it also provides multiple scenarios and examples of roles um, throughout the web page. Finally, there's um, several resources in the implementation guide that can support project planning, including sample narratives for an institutional review board and maintenance of certification part four applications. Um, additionally, we have sample parent caregiver partner position descriptions that can support recruitment of parents to the multidisciplinary team. Um, and it should also be noted that practices planning on engaging in the family engagement so why project may need to have their project approved by an institutional review board. So the last thing I'm going to discuss is uh, supporting measurable improvement. Um, so once you've convened your expert work group, this group can help guide the development of the project aims and measures. Um, and as Alex had mentioned, a copy of the aims and measures used throughout our family engagement quality improvement project is available for download on the um, implementation guide online. Participating teams um, can test small changes using plan, do, study, act cycles, or PDSA to achieve improvement um, on project measures. And during the PDSA cycles, teams are going to test or try a new task or activity. They're encouraged to test very small changes. Um, and an example of this would be that a team may decide to test a teach back strategy with one family. Um, and learning from testing is significant with up to 50% of tests not expected to yield improvement. Uh, PDSA cycles are typically designed to demonstrate improvement in, in the project measures. So if your project measures are focused on shared decision making, teams may begin by testing this technique on one patient and one family. Um, one of the reasons that the tests are encouraged to be small and with fewer people is to lower the risks um, if the tests do not yield improvement. Um, smaller tests will also provide teams with better data to prove that a new way of doing something works better. Um, so based on the experience of one test, a team can make changes to an entire task and test it, and test it out on another family. So um, PDSA cycles are a very iterative process um, and changes are often refined multiple times until teams feel that they are getting it right um, and that they've identified something that can be measured to actually show improvement. So as the organizing group for, um, for an FEQIP, one of your roles is going to be to support practice teams in achieving measurable improvement on the project measures. Um, and so a handout, again, has been developed by us to determine how your multidisciplinary expert work group can support um, participating teams. So I just wanted to walk through a couple of examples of this. Um, let's say that your team is testing care planning with a family. Um, maybe a member of your multidisciplinary team is part of the state Title V program, and maybe they're able to provide a sample care plan. Um, or if there's a pediatric clinician on the expert work group, um, they could provide coaching if they have already engaged in, um, in this type of strategy. A family caregiver member of the expert work group can also offer education or training um, to participating teams on how to best develop care plans in partnership with families. Um, and these types of um, interactions with your expert work group and your practice teams can be offered through a webinar or through an in-person training. So some tools and resources to support your measurable improvement. Um, as with the previous resources, we wanted to share a few um, that would come, that come from the National Center. So the FEQIP implementation guide includes the comprehensive change package, as Alex had mentioned. Um, and it also includes sample PDSA cycles within the change package. And these are really good templates for participating practices who haven't tested changes in practice before um, and who might be interested in knowing how to utilize tools for the change package. The implementation guide also includes information on webinars that were facilitated with participating practices. Um, and also during, our, um, during the National Center's FEQIP, as Alex had mentioned, two in-person learning sessions were hosted um, to provide education and support to practices. And agendas and agenda books from these learning sessions are available uh, on, on the implementation guide online. And National Center staff would also be very happy to connect you 
with expert faculty and practices that have successfully tested changes in practice. Thank you so much, um, Muge and Alex. Uh, we'd like to now move on to the participant question and answer portion of the webinar. So as a reminder, uh, you can chat in your question into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. And uh, we've gotten a few questions already, so I will pose those to our faculty. Um, there have been a couple asking about slides and you know, the hyperlinks available, so those will be sent out. Um, after the webinar, and all of the materials will be posted onto the National Center website. Um, so I'd like to start with um, the first question. And so this is for Alex. Um, you had mentioned how learning that the surveys were not the best method for feedback was uh, very important. Uh, would you be able to speak more about what methods parents recommended, and did any of the teams try out those methods? Yeah, Kate, that's a great question. Um, so there were a couple things recommended. Um, the first is looking at social media and specifically Facebook. And um, I know a couple practices set up Facebook groups where they encourage um, uh, parents to provide feedback via Facebook. Um, but one particularly innovative method to gather feedback from families was actually designed and implemented by one of the parent partners on a, um, a core improvement team. Um, so this individual, the practice was in a rural location, and it was a, um, a very small, um, a small patient population where many of the families knew each other outside of the practice. And so the parent partner on the core improvement team decided to organize, um, I don't know what the official title of this event was, um, but it was essentially like a community night out at the practice, and it was celebrating um, an anniversary of the practice being open, I think like 20 or 25 years. And so this family partner invited all the families that um, were patients in the practice, and then she invited a lot of other community organizations, um, again, to build partnerships throughout the whole community and to um, allow the community organizations to get to know families as well. And this community night out sort of provided, um, I guess, a less formal way to gather feedback from families about their experiences. Um, uh, you know, seeking care within the practice. Um, so those were, so again, using social media and this sort of community night out were two of the most innovative ways that parents um, suggested getting feedback other than family surveys. Um, but two other strategies that were implemented was focus groups and parent advisory councils. Um, those, I think, are a little bit more well-known, and there's a lot of resources on both of those tools. Um, both of those strategies available on our website and through other organizations like NICHQ or the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care. And we can definitely follow up on those after the webinar. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we look forward to, to your uh, resources and follow up on that. Um, the next question asks, how do you ensure that the parent partners represent the diversity of the families served? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think the way that we approach diversity and recruiting diverse parent partners um, really focus on recruiting diverse practices. Um, so when we put out the call for applications for practices to apply, um, the call for applications said that there had to be a parent partner as a member of the team, so the practices knew that at the outset. And we were really focusing on recruiting practices that were in really diverse um, areas of the country. So thinking about diversity in terms of geography, so we recruited practices that were in very rural frontier settings, actually, and practices that were in really inner city urban settings. Um, we recruited practices that were on the East Coast, West Coast. Uh, we had a, a practice in Hawaii, um, you know, really as, as diverse as you can think of in terms of geography. And then we thought of diversity in terms of practice types. So we had um, smaller practices. Uh, we had community health centers, uh, FQHCs, academic medical centers. Um, so that's sort of where we started in terms of diversity. And then uh, based on that, we encouraged the practice teams to recruit parent partners um, that were um, representative of their patient population. So we did sort of leave it up to um, the core improvement teams to recruit their own parent partners. And again, as we mentioned during the webinar, we provided job descriptions and suggestions on 
how best to um, you know, engage these individuals, but it was really up to the practice teams to pick that individual. Um, and in some of the practice teams, um, they already actually had a parent partner, and so they kind of went with that person because they had a relationship with them, and the, that individual knew the practice team and um, was sort of already um, engaged in medical home-like activities. And in some practices, they did not have a parent partner, and so they kind of started from scratch. The other way that we thought about diversity, and you'll notice throughout the presentation, we um, referred to it as a family partner, a parent partner, or a caregiver partner. Well, in all of our written materials and all of our recruitment materials, we um, definitely have the word caregiver because we didn't want to limit it just to um, like a mom and dad. You know, we had a uh, grandmother participate as a caregiver partner, and we wanted to be inclusive of all the different types of caregivers that are out there for children and youth, whether those children and youth had special health care needs or didn't have special health care needs. Um, so hopefully that helps to address that question a little bit. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the next question that, that came in um, said, can you tell us more about the technical assistance you gave the teens related to care planning and family strengths? Um, what form did that technical assistance take? Yeah, great question. So I will start with the care planning. Um, and I'll say at the outset that this, practice, this project did not focus in exclusively on children and youth with special health care needs. So we were inclusive of, of all children, whether or not they had special health care needs or they did not have special health care needs. So going into that, we knew that not every uh, medical record that was reviewed uh, would be a child that required a comprehensive care plan. So we used the terms care plan and medical summary. And um, when we first met in person for an in-person learning session, this was one of the key questions that came up actually in the pre-implementation survey, which was distributed before we met for the first time in person. And practices were really confused about what we met. We meant by care plan or a medical summary and what does this mean and how are we supposed to um, you know, implement this in partnership with families. Um, so we obviously, we provided definitions, but then we also um, had a session at the very first in-person learning session. It was about an hour in length, and the guest faculty was a parent and a pediatrician, and they presented together on care planning and on shared decision making and how to uh, really look at the shared plan of care and how to actually implement that in practice. We also offer templates of what a care plan and a medical summary would look like. Uh, one resource we used frequently was the Lucille Packard Foundation Share Plan of Care Guide, and then NICHQ also has a really good template. Um, it's actually like an online template that where you can build a care plan, whether or not it's for a child with a special health care need or a child without a special health care need. So we offered those resources. Um, then during the project, we also offered a follow-up educational webinar on shared decision making and care planning. And then at the second in-person learning session, um, we also offered some technical assistance and support on that through our quality improvement advisor. And then um, the, that quality improvement advisor also held one-on-one -on -one coaching calls with each of the individual practice teams. So teams were required to participate in at least two of those calls throughout the duration of the project. And so teams that wanted extra support and extra um, resources on care planning um, you know, utilize those coaching calls as um, a way to receive that support. Um, with respect to family strength, it's sort of sort of same situation. Um, we had a project measure related to family strengths, and during the very first in-person learning session, again, teams were really confused as to what did we mean by family strengths, and how do you identify family strengths, and you know, once you've identified them, what do you do with them? How do you build relationships with families? And we used um, two key resources. The first was um, the Protecting Families Initiative, or Strengthening Families Initiative, and they have, um, we can send out the link, I think it's actually in the implementation guide, they have these really amazing resources that we use to do education around uh, protective factors and what is a family strength and what kinds of questions can you ask families to identify family strength. And um, we had one of our expert work group members was actually an expert on this topic, and so she presented some educational sessions during a monthly webinar on this topic. Um, and then the other uh, resource that we use was Bright Futures. So Bright Futures really focuses on family strengths, and they have a lot of really, really great resources related to this topic. Um, and so we sent out Bright Futures resources, and we provided support, again, on what kinds of questions to ask families and how to ask them in culturally competent ways. 
Um, and I think this was actually, I don't, I don't have the, the run charts in front of me, but I think this is actually the project measure where we saw the most improvement from the beginning of the project to the end of the project. So we feel pretty proud about that. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, our next question comes from a pediatric hospitalist. And she asked, do you have any thoughts or ideas on how to improve family-centered care in the inpatient uh, or non-medical home setting? Yeah, that's um, a great question. I will admit that uh, all of our work in family-centered care quality improvement has taken place in the primary care practice setting, so in the primary care medical home. Um, that being said, we definitely had practices that were part of larger academic medical centers participate in this latest iteration of the project. Um, I think many of the components of family-centered care and family engagement are um, very similar, whether you're in primary care or in tertiary care in terms of shared decision-making and care coordination. So a lot of those resources, I think, would remain the same. One key uh, resource that I would recommend for individuals in the hospital setting is the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care, or IPFCC. And again, we can send that out to uh, participants afterwards. But that organization has a lot of resources that are specifically tailored to the hospital population. And they have a lot of resources on how to form family advisory councils specifically within a hospital setting. So I would say that would probably be one of the best organizations to go to. The, um, it looks like we have one more question, so if others have questions, uh, please get those in in the chat box. Um, the next question is, how do you suggest increasing um, or encouraging parent partner participation within a practice without taxing the practice professional staff? Um, parent partners are such an asset within a practice, but maintaining their particip participation uh, has challenges as well. Yeah, that's a um, great question again. I think one of the key things is having um, tasks or clear roles for the parent partner that they could do, um, you know, obviously in collaboration with the practice, but independently as well. Um, there was one practice that participated in the project that had a parent partner um, who had very specific tasks that she did day in, day out with families. So she would meet with families after a visit, and she would um, ask them a couple questions about their visit, and she would also help um, serve almost like a peer navigator. And she kind of did that on her own. She didn't have to, um, you know, do this with the pediatrician in the room or with the nurse in the room or anything like that. So having, um, having that role was really important to her. Um, there was a, another practice I'd mentioned where the parent partner had organized that community night out. And again, that was sort of like her project that she implemented, uh, again, with support from the practices, but she spearheaded it and it was her initiative. And um, she pulled it together. So having a very, very concrete task um, helps to have that parent partner engaged. Um, the other thing that I will say about this question is I think it's a good question to pose back to the practice teams that participated in this project. So we can do that as follow-up from this webinar and send out suggestions, um, again, to all the participants so everyone has that information. Thank you, Alex and, and Muge. I'm not seeing any more uh, questions in the queue, so I think uh, now I will turn it over to Muge to uh, cover some additional resources that are available. And uh, thank you all for your great questions. I think that led to some great um, discussion and um, for the information about the project. Excellent. Thank you, Kate and Alex. And thank you, everyone, who submitted questions. That was a um, very fruitful discussion. Um, so I just wanted to share some additional resources from the National Center. Um, we have many, many resources that can support medical home implementation at the practice and state level. Um, and this slide is just a few from our website. Uh, I wanted to discuss or to share um, the Shared Plan of Care fact sheet, which is a fact sheet that was developed in partnership with the National Academy for State Health Policy. Um, and it discusses the roles of state programs and agencies in creating shared plans of care for families of children with special health care needs. Um, we also have a family engagement webinar series that was conducted in 2017. Um, and it's a three-part series that focuses on family engagement at um, the clinical, the organizational, and the systems level. Um, we also have a web page with tools related to all components of the medical home 
um, for practices, and then another web page with resources specifically for families and caregivers. Um, and then finally, there's a comprehensive online resource guide um, for practices and organizations looking to begin the medical um, home transformation process. And this is Kate again. I, I'd also like to share a couple of uh, family engagement resources from AMCHIP. Um, in 2014 and 15, we conducted a survey about family engagement policies and practices in Title V maternal and child health and children and youth with special health care needs programs. Um, and this was funded um, through the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. So um, the findings from that provide a snapshot of strategies to support meaningful family engagement, um, effective and innovative practices, and areas of need for improvement and technical assistance. Uh, we have an executive summary posted on our website and then accompanying briefs uh, that detail uh, specific survey topics. So you can see there are some around creating a culture of family engagement, levels of family engagement, the roles of family staff or consultants, um, family members being employed as staff, um, sustaining and diversifying family engagement, and then evaluation. Um, and then on the next slide, uh, we also have some case studies that go along with it that provide some practical, or practical um, replicable strategies for engaging families um, based on examples from five states. Um, and there's one specifically on engaging diverse populations. I know that that was a question earlier. So um, this case study has um, examples from two states on how their Title V programs engage diverse populations, and then um, some broad family engagement uh, case studies from three states. And then we have additional uh, publications that are on our website, which will be in the hyperlink slides that you receive. Excellent. Um, so that concludes our, um, our webinar for today. We wanted to thank everyone um, so much for your questions and for um, your time and sharing your experiences and expertise with us. Um, this webinar recording, slides, and unanswered questions, as well as resources that were discussed, uh, will be archived on uh, the National Center for Medical Home Implementation website about a week from today. Um, additionally, you'll receive an email after this webinar um, and we'll be asking you to complete an evaluation. And it's very short. It's only like five, uh, five questions. Um, and this will help to improve our webinars for the future. We'd greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, please do not hesitate to contact our staff team if you have any questions um, or would like any technical support related to any of the resources or topics that we discussed today. Um, we really enjoyed the webinar, and thank you again.